I am very happy to introduce Sean Bailing. Uh, she works for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Washington State. Uh, she's a wildlife biologist, and her background uh, as a plant physiologist, spatial analyst, and GIS professor prepared her well to analyze riparian vegetation patterns and the effects of beavers on the landscape. Sean's educational background includes University of Washington, University of Maryland, and Seattle University, and she is lucky to have had positions analyzing plant and animal communities with the Smithsonian, USAID, USFS, and USGS. My name is Sean Beeling, and I am really excited to talk to you today about our relocation permit program. There's an important word in the name of my talk, and that is the word pilot. In Washington State, we have the benefit of being able to develop pilot projects before we put them into a more permanent state. And all of that pilot project information is all contained within an RCW that made this particular program possible. RCW is the revised code of Washington. It's what's happened when a bill gets passed and the legislature um, is able to make that bill a bit more permanent. So through this pilot project uh, RCW, I'm able to have the space to be able to analyze the effectiveness of any program we begin in my agency. We can modify those requirements, we can change those procedures, and we can also respond to feedback from our both our permittees and the public and the landowners and the science that's performed after relocation occurs. So while this RCW was instrumental, it was not nearly as critical as this particular RCW, RCW 345313. And this particular RCW was passed in 2012, revised again in 2017. And this was through the hard work of the Tulalip tribes and other associated tribes. This is the pivotal RCW that allows for the release of wild beavers into Washington State's landscape. And because this RCW has been in place, then we are able to create our relocation permit program. This is just a little bit of this RCW. I encourage you to go look it up. It has a lot of great language that encourages our agency to be able to, allows us to focus in on making sure that we are in, uh, that we are looking over this relocation permit program. We're analyzing this program and that it is controlled by a permit. So, it is not serendipity that this is happening in Washington state and it is not magic that your, a, your agenda for this um, conference is dominated by people from Washington state. It's because we have incredibly devoted and smart and experienced people running relocation and have been running relocation for many years before this, uh, this program began in my agency. The Tulalip tribes, uh, started by Molly Aves, who's going to be talking in just a second, was started um, back in 2014. And we also have the Metau Beaver Project, which was originally started working with the U.S. Forest Service, um, which has been practicing relocation back in 2008. So with all of these smart and experienced people already doing relocation in my state, why is it that a regulatory agency should come to the party? Um, Filling out permits is nobody's favorite uh, and just seems like it's just a little extra layer that maybe doesn't need to be there. Well, we do need to have this permit program for a couple of main tenants. We want to ensure that anyone who is practicing relocation is making sure that there is humane care of these animals. Doing wildlife uh, interactions, especially if you're a member of the public, is dangerous. But we want to ensure that these individuals are kept uh, as safe as possible throughout the entire process when they're being trapped, when they're being transported, when they're being kept in captivity, and when they're finally being released. We also want to make sure that these animals are, um, are 
allowed to be able to thrive wherever they eventually be released. And to do that, we need to support our permittees. We need to educate our permittees on how to properly select a release site. And we want to ensure that our permittees are uh, kept up to date as much as possible with the information we receive as a state agency about invasive species and pathogens that might affect beavers and the watersheds that these animals are released into. We also want to help make sure that our permittees are supported as they navigate relationships with landowners, troubleshoot any husbandry issues that may come down the line, and just do what we can to be able to get through those issues that might arise whenever you're working with wildlife. However, we also are pretty excited about that data, and so we ask our permittees to, re uh, to report back to us information about that relocation. Try to keep that to a minimum, and uh, we'll talk more about what that data looks like and um, what we require of our permittees in a couple of slides. So how do we know if this program is being successful? As a pilot program, it's, we need to uh, analyze the success of this to be able to decide if we should make this into law uh, later down the line. And luckily, this particular program has a single objective, and that single objective is reducing lethal removals. All of our permittees, most of our permittees, are associated with nonprofits, and those nonprofits have their own goals on why they may do relocation. My goal and this program's goal is solely to reduce lethal removals. And because of that, all of our permittees are educated in how the steps of deciding whether relocation is the best option um, should take, uh, how that decision tree should occur uh, as part of our education process. And so when we ask our permittees to participate in our education program, then we are showing that they are ambassadors. We do our best to be able to um, connect our permittees with the organizations that are experts in the field in mitigation um, before we ever come to that decision to perform relocation. So another reason that why another reason why we decided to begin the permit program, aside from just that that is already written into this particular RCW, is that we spend a lot of time working with beavers in fish and wildlife. Beavers are the second most frequent reason why somebody gives us a call, and unfortunately, in most of those cases, beaver as our beavers are lethally removed from those landscapes frequently. Uh, we had 502 beavers removed from private landowners um, and public landowners in 2020, and that's not an unusual number. There's a lot of lethal removals, and we would like to minimize that as much as possible. Unfortunately, we only have so many biologists in uh, my agency, and relocation is very time consumptive. And so the permit program allows for voluntary participants to be permitted and perform these as citizens. So um, we are, know that we need to be able to make sure that our citizens are trained. And so this is a free training program, and we're really lucky that we are able to collaborate with folks that donate their time to help us build the curriculum to train our permittees. Um, we have lots of collaborators that I am incredibly grateful for. The Metal Beaver Project, Beavers Northwest, the Tulalip Tribes, Cowlitz and the Trout Unlimited all participated um, and focused in on how to build our curriculum. And in fact, because uh, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife is new to this relocation game, we depended on them entirely for helping us build this curriculum. We have two parts to our curriculum. Our first part is an online course that anyone can participate in. And the second part is a in-person field training. And the in-person field training is really the most exciting part. We get to meet all of our permittees. We get to uh, make sure that folks are able to perform site assessments. We make sure that those folks have experience working with the types of traps that we use and understand how to operate those traps as humanely as possible. We also make sure that our permittees are aware of what sort of local resources they have. We have experts in Washington State. We wanna make sure that they use them first, because as I said, the only reason why this permit program exists is to have a last ditch resort before uh, opting for a lethal removal. So how do you become a permittee? Um, it's relatively simple. You need to be make sure that you are 18 years or older, 
You need to make sure that you have not committed any wildlife crimes or have any infractions within the past three years. You need to submit a relocation plan and a statement of your qualifications or experience. And in many cases, our permittees do not have much experience. Um, and so we encourage those folks to be able to work with those resources that we introduce them to during the education process to build that experience. There's so many experts in the field. Uh, Fish and Wildlife hopes that those folks are able to get those uh, bits of experience that they need to be able to do this efficiently. We need to make sure that our permittees comply with the requirements of the permit program. Hopefully those, com those requirements are as minimal as possible. Mostly this is turning in reports and following our regulations about making sure that you are uh, relocating these beavers into sites that are appropriate for that beaver to thrive. And the largest hurdle of all, our permittees need to have some access to an approved beaver husbandry facility. So those approved beaver husbandry facilities are a wide range. So I'm gonna show you our gold standard. This is in um, the Metau Beaver Projects uh, Association with a, a federal fish hatchery. This is one of the salmon runs that the fish hatchery has been in agreement with the uh, Metau Beaver Project to allow them to use this as a husbandry facility. In general, these husbandry facilities need to have a water source that is refreshed daily. We need to have some sort of infrastructure to make sure that beavers do not climb out or dig out. There needs to be a shelter of some form that is made of non-chewable materials and needs to be partially shaded. We need to make sure that this entire enclosure is protected from disturbance. There needs to be some form of cleaning regimen and daily monitoring. And every year I come out and inspect those facilities and make sure that it's upheld to these standards. Um, this, of course, is a beautiful uh, facility. The Metau Beaver Project are experts in the field, but this is not uh, the standard. Uh, we, we also see that some of our permittees opt for homegrown systems that are built out of, um, I don't know, fencing material and stock watering tanks. And as long as they meet our criteria to ensure that these animals are kept safe and um, as humanely as possible, then we will approve those facilities as well. All right, so maybe the biggest and most difficult part of this entire process is release site selection. Of course, this is a stunningly beautiful location to release your beaver, but knowing if this is the best choice for the landscape um, and also for making sure that, that beaver uh, is able to thrive is a big question. And as a lot of the practitioners that are a part of this program um, learn, being able to decide where those fine details lie and how to be able to quantify that decision-making process um, to be less uh, subjective is a really difficult step. So we encourage our permittees and train our permittees to be able to use a analysis system that has three main parts. The first part of the release site selection process is to ensure that beavers are only released into the same watershed from which they have been trapped. So this can be very difficult because we have an enormous state and there's a lot of locations where beavers should be, that, that, is, that is the goal of a lot of these organiza organizations, but we do have this in place for a couple of main reasons. And one of those reasons is that we are very concerned with some species that, uh, some species of fungus that infect uh, our amphibians in Washington state. So chythrid fungus is something that we are monitoring as best we possibly can, but it is something that we're still learning a lot about. And so ensuring that these relocations are uh, kept in a tight space uh, on the landscape is hopefully going to give us some opportunity to learn more before we see this spread. We're also worried about mud snail. We're also worried about pathogens. There's so much we don't know in Washington state. So trying to keep these relocations tight in the same landscape area will hopefully keep these, um, these uh, invasives and uh, diseases at bay. In order to make sure that our permittees are kept up to date with where we know these uh, pathogens and invasives might be, we have a web map that is a part of our permittee uh, website so that folks can come here to this website, see where, what new information there is, and hopefully reflect on that as they're performing their relocation. 
The other, the second step, once you've decided on the uh, watershed to do your relocation in, is deciding which site to use within it. And luckily we have uh, an incredibly detailed model to base that relocation on. This is the BIP or the Beaver Intensive, uh, Beaver Intrinsic Potential Map. Um, and this model was built by Dr. Ben Dipbrenner. He's right back there and you're welcome to talk to him about it. But essentially what's happening with this uh, map and this model in general is taking three main criteria of every reach in Washington state and giving it a code based on how much water is going to be coming through each one of these watersheds, what's going to be happening with uh, bankful width, and what happens with valley width. By combining all of these measurements, and we're able to have a scoring process that tells you if each reach of a stream is appropriate or not appropriate based on these three criteria. So coming back to the BIP, this is just one of many different GIS layers that we offer to our permittees to help them find the perfect site for their beaver. So not just the BIP alone, we also offer a map to help our permittees find which uh, parcels are owned by which entities. We encourage our permittees to look at how far our beavers will need to travel across the landscape to get to forage materials and whether those forage materials are high or low quality. We also want to make sure that our permittees are aware of uh, where there have been conflict sites in the past. And we want to make sure that folks are also aware of where there could be roads, where there might be culverts or other, other infrastructure that we need our beavers to avoid. All right, so all of this is great. We have used the same watershed. We found a site somewhere on our BIP, whether you're using just overlay analysis or simply looking at a point on the map and scrolling through all the layers. But the most critical part of the entire site selection process is actually going to that site itself. And in order to make sure that this step of the process is as easy as possible, we have a, uh, a web form to help our permittees decide if that site is a good choice or not. All right, so that web form, it starts with three main filters. We want to make sure that that site that is being considered for uh, relocation has social tolerance. Has the landowner spoken to you, the relocator? Uh, has the landowner spoken to neighbors? Second, are there already beavers in that location actively at this moment? And third, is there any potential for there to be damage with the beaver presence? If the permittee decides that those are not issues in this particular site, then we can go on to more detailed analyses. What does the, the volume of water flowing through this uh, area look like? Do we see that there's evidence of elk, deer, or cattle? Do we see that there's human presence on the landscape? And all of these are quantified in a Likert scale to give a quantitative data point so that our permittees have the aid of all of these numbers to help make their decision. Selecting the re relocation site is the permittee's responsibility, and they get the final say on whether that uh, site should be used or not. So we spend a lot of time on our education process to make sure that our permittees are as well informed on this step as possible. Okay, so I told you that we're excited about data in my agency, and so we do ask for some data back from our permittees, and those bits of data we try to keep as minimal as possible. First, we need to ensure that each and every site has a landowner agreement. And those landowner agreements require that the landowner has spoken to the neighbors both up and downstream. There can be no relocation without this landowner agreement already signed in hand. The next step is that we need to make sure that we have some idea about the beavers that are being used in this program. Now, these beavers, um, they, the only data that we require is the number, the weight, and the length. We've tried to keep our data collection as minimally invasive as possible. So it may be up to each one of our permittees to decide if they'd like to sex the beaver, if they would like to tag the beaver. Um, other data points are fine, and we'd like to know about those if they are collected, but they're not a requirement of the program. We also require the release site assessment, which I just spoke about in that last slide. And just to be clear, the release site assessment needs to be completed before the beaver is trapped. We want to minimize the amount of time that any beaver is held in captivity. And so if there's not already a release site that's been approved by the permittee, then a, uh, the trapping should not occur. 
and last, we want to make sure that post-release monitoring is taken place. So we want to know if that beaver has moved on. We want to know if there's changes in that landscape. Because while our goal is to release or reduce lethal removals, we still need to be able to analyze this the best we possibly can. And those landscape measurements are one way to do that. All right, so we have our education process. We have our data. Who is participating in this permit program? Well, we offer this, as I said, free to anybody who'd like to come. And so we have a wide range of folks that are participating in at least the training program. I'm really excited to say that we have a broad range. We have folks that are coming from nonprofits most of the time, but we also have folks that are in academia and various forms of government and LLCs and a lot of participation from tribes. Um, I'd like to see that increased, but um, I'll, I'll do what I can to make that happen. The folks that participate in our training do not all decide to apply for permits. And most of the nonprofits and uh, uh, and the county agency folks that you see as a part of this pie graph are actually moving on in the program and apply for that permit. And in total, we've issued 33 total permits. Those permits can be renewed each year through a, a, a simplified process. These permits are specified to individual counties. And one of the reasons why we do that is because it's required as part of the permit program that each one of our traps are visited at least every 24 hours. So if your home base is too far away from where your trapping site might be, then you will not be approved to be able to uh, relocate in that location. And so far, we have had 71 total beaver relocations since the program began in 2019. Whether this has been a successful program or not um, is, again, based solely on how many lethal removals we no longer have. But we also want to know what's happening on that landscape. And so through those post-release uh, release site analyses, um, we are able to gauge that about 83% of the releases that we've had in the program so far show that there's beaver activity in that same site at least three seasons later. And when we ask our permittees to, par to participate in this program, um, we make sure that folks know that we really have no idea if what is happening on that landscape. If beavers that are present in that landscape three seasons later are the same beaver that were a part of the relocation in the first place. It could be absolutely anybody. We don't require tagging. We don't require uh, pit tags or ear tags. So it could be just any beaver that decided to colonize. Nevertheless, we're still excited about the potential that this could show that beavers are using, um, are, are using this landscape and are benefiting uh, from the relocation program. All right, so we are also performing some analyses to help make sure that we have some basis of what's going on in our beaver population in Washington State. We have no idea how many beavers are in Washington State. And one step in being able to do that is to perform an eDNA study that we have partnered with the, um, uh, the oh man, I totally forgot the name of that researcher. I'm so sorry, but a researcher in Washington State uh, University that is um, helping to look at a couple of different sites on both the east and the west side to help us figure out that chythrid fungus is, is, a, um, is present in areas where beavers have been relocated. And if we can quantify how many beavers happen to be in the landscape simply by taking a eDNA uh, sample at uh, some point in that watershed. We need to develop this program further, but we need to wait for those preliminary results before we can go to the next step. But I'm very hopeful that this might be, give us an idea of being able to quantify the number of beavers that we have. I'm also really excited that I have been given the green light to do some GIS analysis later this summer. Um, we're gonna be looking at how these models that we offer to our relocators um, might be compared to other models that are out there. Well, I'm excited to say that in my preliminary research for the riparian buffer analysis and the surface water analysis of results from relocation uh, that I'm performing through Google Earth Engine shows that there is a pretty significant change in the riparian buffer around each one of these relocation sites. And I'm seeing an increase of uh, surface water in uh, for relocations that happened last year of about 3% and an increase in surface water for relocations that happened in the previous year of about 11%. So still need to 
process that information, but I am really hopeful that this will give us um, some great information about how relocations affect the landscape. All right, folks, well, I'll just hurry over here so that you can ask your questions. My name is Sean Veeling. I would love to talk to you further about this and uh, I'm happy to have any questions. I have a bit of a two-parter. Um, so you mentioned Kitrid in your um, talk and I was wondering what the mitigation plan for Kitrid as we strive for more expansive wetland areas would be. And then is there a potential negative response to the outlook of beavers in them being seen as a, a harbinger of an expansive wetland that would then create more contact for chytrid to be spread about in invasive in like native frog species yeah great questions and honestly something we know very little about and because we know so very little about it um, it is a main contributor to why we have funded this study with wsu so hoping that we'll know more and how to mitigate in the future. Hi, sounds like a great program. Um, as a, a restoration ecologist, one of the um, realities that I think about is whether folks are constrained to the data and to the, the mapping that you have in your program or whether they can identify um, de novo a site that they want to trans translocate the beaver to um, for restoration purposes. Is that something that is you're flexible about or? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, we offer these tools and we educate our permittees in the hopes that they are um, bolstered in their decision making process. But the release site is entirely up to the relocator. Um, we ask that each one of our permittees have a discussion with their local habitat bio at the beginning of each permit season, but the individual site does not need to be approved by anyone. That is entirely up to the permittee. Uh, I was just curious where you thought the uh, opportunity and potential for growth was either on public lands or on large privately owned tracks. Like I'm assuming I'm from Pennsylvania, so I'm assuming there's a lot of logging it, uh, landowners and such where you in the state of Washington. So I was just curious what your thoughts are on the potential for growth. Yeah, I am really excited about that, actually. We have pie in the sky dreams of being able to pay private landowners that are interested in having beavers on their landscape. Um, that's still in an infant stage, but it could actually happen. We also have relationships that we are trying to build with the Forest Service, the National Park Service, and smaller parks around Washington State. Um, those are discussions that are becoming more frequent. Um, as I said, relocation has been happening for a long time before this permit program ever existed. And we are just happy that we have experts and these relationships that we get to develop as we move forward. We're really hoping that this could eventually become a rule. Um, we have some changes that we'd like to make to the program before that happens. But so far, things are moving in a direction that seems somewhat positive. The data still needs to come back. Fantastic. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Sean. No problem. Thank you. For All right. Me.